Tēnā koutou katoa and hello everybody. Welcome to the Lento Intervention Podcast. My name is Ben Adelberg and I'm coming to you from Tamaki Makara, Auckland. Tēnā ka mihi ke te mana, whenua o Aotearoa and we acknowledge the local tribal authorities of New Zealand. And g'day, I'm Emma Strutt and I'm currently coming to you from Gungaloo country in Queensland. Before we dive into our conversation today, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to sea, land and community. The Lento Intervention is an Australasian educational and advocacy platform dedicated to raising awareness about the current climate and health crisis. And on this podcast, we invite guests to chat about topics that will inspire you to take action to improve your own health and the health of the planet. So please subscribe to and share this podcast and visit our website for the full show notes. And don't forget to buy us a coffee if you'd like to support our work. Just a few episodes prior, Season 3, Episode 9, we had a fascinating chat with Dr. Jack Santa Barbara, who spoke about the current predicament we find ourselves in regarding energy use and our limits to growth. I feel like that was chapter one, and what we're about to do is take a deep dive with a sequel into the world of renewable energy. That's right. So today we'll be talking to Professor Simon Michel, an Associate Professor of Geometallurgy at the Geological Survey of Finland, working in the Circular Economy Solutions Unit. With degrees in physics and geology and a PhD in mining engineering, Simon has been involved in a number of high profile research programs and has a very strong interest in modeling energy systems. He's recently published an incredibly comprehensive and very long report assessing the extra capacity required to completely transition away from fossil fuels to alternative power systems. It's not as straightforward as the media coverage makes it appear. Um, So there's a lot to cover today. Simon, thank you so much for joining us. Hello. So it is very nice to talk to you guys. Uh, As it turns out, I talk to people all over the world and I'm talking to about, I don't know what I'm up to now, is it four or five groups in New Zealand? It's like the people in New Zealand are actually prepared to have the conversation in ways that the rest of the world isn't. So um, yeah, I'm very happy to work with you because what I need to be doing is working with people who are prepared to meet these challenges. And it starts with a conversation. So uh, I'm very happy to talk to you guys. And we're very privileged to have you on here for a number of reasons. One of them is you're lacking a tremendous amount of sleep. You did a 2 a.m. presentation this morning to University of Queensland. Um, Yeah, like you say, you do a lot of presentations. I remember seeing one of yours uh, about a year prior. I think Dr. Mike Joy, who's a regular on our show, was part of that. Let's start off with a little bit about who you are. Um, tell us a bit about your background. You are Australian, I believe, yes, I um, but currently in Finland, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that's happened in between. <laughs> tell us about that fascinating journey to start with. So, all right, my basic degree is a Bachelor of Applied Science, Physics and Geology. Uh, the original plan, I've, I've gone through many, many plans, and they all fail, which is why I've bounced around. And <laughs> so... The original plan when I was uh, training um, for science was to work in a nuclear power plant. And when I was an undergraduate, and this was, what, 1992, uh, Indonesia was going to build, I think it was a planned six nuclear reactors. And so all the people in physics degrees thought, great, we can get employment. And uh, that didn't actually happen. So anyway, so uh, Bachelor of Applied Science in um, Physics and Geology, I managed to get uh, I attach myself to a research group at the University of Queensland called the JKMRC. Uh, and I was involved in the research in comminution and rock breakage. Uh, I worked for 18 years. Um, oh, I did my PhD at the JKMRC uh, in blasting. Um, I used to physically blow up rocks in a mine site in Indrapilly in Brisbane. In Indrapilly? So, yes. The, so it was a mine site. We're allowed to do it. And so according to the law, uh, we're allowed to do it. And there was a very small amount of explosives and there was a lot of perception management with uh, the neighbours to make sure that they were all cool. And, and, and frankly, they didn't even hear it. Um, that's next door to Tu Wong. And I lived in Tu Wong. Uh, <laughs> right. Jeez, that's, that's mind boggling. Okay. Right. There's, there's, actually, <laughs> there's actually an old silver mine in Indrapilly and it's still there. And wow. uh, so the University okay. of Queensland has got it as a training, uh, training exercise. And uh, 
it goes to you know a couple hundred meters underground and there's an open pit and so it's now a world-class research center and they do very good work and so anyway so um i got was in the australian mining industry for about um uh, I don't know, 18 years where i was doing research and development uh it was industry funded research a lot of it was confidential um and um to try and sort of um uh, research and develop uh, better ways to, you know, uh, do mining, especially associated with the crushing and grinding of rock, energy uh, consumption thereof. So there was a lot of that. Uh, then I did a, a, a um, and I joined a geometallurgy project. And so for eight years, I was part of the Amira P843 projects, which was uh, ge what we now call geometallurgy, which is the blending of geology and mineral processing. Uh, then I joined the Communication Research. I left um, university, joined the private sector for a bit. I worked for a company called Asenko for a short time, supporting feasibility studies. I learned a lot about how the private sector really worked. Like I was talking to regularly corporations at an executive board level. And um, some of the stuff I saw really shocked me, actually. You know, like, uh, um, because when, when you're in university, we were, we we're trying to do the best we can to, to get the best technical outcome. But in the business sector, uh, they don't necessarily do that. Like, like they could be just trying to drive up the share price. Uh, you know, see, I mean, it, was, it was a little this. Uh, it was a little demoralising actually. Uh, so, uh, so I left, and then the mining industry crashed in 2013, 2014. People like me were all on the street at the same time, and uh, well, not on the street, but um, we couldn't get jobs. And the only jobs that I could actually get at the time was um, I was a labourer on an organic farm where, in Mount Tamarine when I was living. And I was a um, I was mowing lawns for rich people and I was a furniture removalist, carrying pianos in the rain. I did that for a year. And so for a year, my qualifications meant nothing and my professional contacts meant nothing. And so I had to, at the age of 42, I had to actually labour and keep up with 20-year-olds. Uh, uh, um, and, and so... And while it was tough, it actually cleaned the head. Because um, I went back to the people who were, you know, there, there were some people who didn't get laid off. And so I went back to visit them from time to time. And, and they were terrified. That, but they were institutionalized and they could not envision reinventing themselves. So for a year, PhD stood for post hole digger. And so, um, yeah, mum didn't like that either. Um, but, um, yeah, anyways, so... Uh, I, I'm really the information I was collecting at the time. This was the information that I present. I've been collecting it since about 2006, right? And it's been apparent to me that the mining industry, in particular, but the entire industrial ecosystem, uh, has a series of blind spots that was driving it off a cliff, and they were incapable of seeing it, let alone discussing it, let alone doing something about it. So I decided to leave the Australian mining industry. And at the time, Australia was getting more and more difficult anyway. And so I went to Europe and got a job at the University of Liège. And I joined up uh, working on the circular economy. And I was learning industrial recycling. where uh, with, 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 We had all these cool projects. And uh, one of the ones I really liked was they had these robots sorting trash. Now, I, I, I wasn't part of that project, but I got to watch it happen. And it was cool. Um, so, so they had these robots sorting uh, rubbish on a conveyor belt, and yeah. so I got to see the other side of you know, you know recycling and what does it all mean. And um, I was learning the circular economy. I was going to the European Commission and sitting in in these meetings, and there was a, a, a spectacular amount of bull, uh, uh, bullshit there. Now, the, the amount of money that they were pouring onto these things shocked me. It really did. Like, like one project called H twenty twenty had a budget of sixty five billion with a B, and a vast, vast wow. amount of money. And, and they were supporting about 400 universities across Europe. So, but, okay. And so back in Australia at the time, people who were doing very, very good work were going to the wall because there just was no money. And, and in Europe, they were actually presenting this stuff that which is based on platitudes. And so I went back to the beginning of the circular economy in 2008 and downloaded the original presentations, and they were the same. They said the same things. Uh, and, and nothing had actually changed, uh, and uh, that, that upset me a little, actually. Uh, you, know, you know, for twelve years, you know, they've done what? <laughs> uh, you know, our, our best and brightest were tied up and doing things that just weren't, 
you know, valid or real. Anyway, so um, I, it was a job, and I was to put, I was trying to create a career in industrial recycling on a number of fronts, and I was going I was going for some of the larger corporations like Suez and Viola. Um, and I was on my way back to Australia because the money ran out in Belgium, and I was offered a job um, in Finland called Mineral Intelligence. And I went to the interview. While the money wasn't very good, what really, really surprised me was the people in the interview, senior management, could openly discuss, uh, I, I could discuss uh, with them some challenging information. Like I, I would give them a throwaway line of tasks. I said, what do you think about this? And they, they said, well, what do you mean? I, I asked them, says, uh, well, what, what do you think about the propensity for the European euro to go into a hyperinflationary spiral? And so I'm definitely, oh, oh that's, uh, what, what do you mean by that? And so, so I was able to talk to them about that. And they go, yeah, we, 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 we do see those problems. And, and, and so instead of being told to be quiet and you know, um, ne never say this in front of a sponsor, which, which is what often happened in Australia, you know, uh, don't say anything that might disrupt uh, the flow of money. Uh, in Finland, they were actually able to actually sort of talk about stuff. And everything was accessible because the place is so small. I, I'm, I'm in a research project called Bat Circle, which is the battery chemistry materials handling. Um, and um, the entire Finnish ecosystem, all major players associated with the battery industry can fit into one room, and uh, which which means we can all have a frank discussion. And, and uh, so, yeah, and so I took that job up and that turned out to be um, an excellent decision uh, because the people I work with, they are, they are very, um, uh, they're on top of it in ways that, other, in, in, in here, how they think in, in, in ways that I have not seen elsewhere. And so work is now being done on multiple fronts. Uh, I then was promoted to um, Associate Professor uh, of the Circular Economy Solutions Unit, and I'm attached to a mineral processing pilot plant in Kumpo, which is a five ton an hour flotation plant uh, that does piloting scales. And it's the only it's the only one in Europe like it, like it's uh, it's the only flotation circuit like it. And so I started this work. Um, um, I actually put together a plan, and that one report that you saw, there's actually six reports and. Five of them are in the air at the moment, and the sixth one is being planned now. Um, so what? it was all part of a chess match. And because I realized I had an opportunity in Finland that didn't exist, exist elsewhere, I went away and thought about what needed to happen here. And so I first got permission to do the work by the did some back of the uh, envelope dis, um, calculations to show that we just didn't have enough minerals to supply easily what we think we're going to supply. And so uh, my management over a cup of coffee asked the basic question of how much minerals and what kind of minerals do we need to service the gigafactories of Europe? Like they're going to build all these factories to build batteries. And that was the plan. In fact, uh, in uh, 2018, every second word was battery. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, and I actually asked them, so, so what happens after batteries? And the room just went silent. <laughs> so, what do we do after batteries? And there is an answer to that, uh, but they they don't they haven't actually sort of um, uh, cottoned onto it yet. Anyway, so so I realised that um, this required a bit of planning. And so, to answer that question of how much minerals we will need, right? I thought it would be a fairly simple thing because so much work is being done. Uh, in, in a mapping entire context here in Europe, I thought, well, the information's there, just go and find it and plug it in and away you go. I, you know, I thought it'd be like an afternoon's work. And But what I found was vast sections of that information was just missing, just hadn't been done. For example, I couldn't find a single report, and I still can't, maybe there is one out there, but I haven't found it yet, that describes how big is the global fleet of cars cars and trucks and aeroplanes. There are lots of uh, studies for individual nations, but no one's put them all together. And that's a problem because when we manufacture anything, like anything at all now, it is a global effort. The market is global. Uh, so, um, and so there were uh, things missing. And, and a lot of these things missing were really simple. Like, like, uh, like I, I was able to explain what I was doing to a seven-year-old little girl 
and she got it on, on the spot. And, 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 she, and she goes, so why is this a thing? Don't you have more important things to do? And, you know, and she's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so but, but when you actually talk to people, say 30 years experience, um, they're, they're, oh, no, 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 no. We do things differently around here. Oh, dear. God. And so the whole system is energy blind, but also mineral blind. Like, I, I was sitting in these European Commission meetings and listening to them talk. Now, coming from the Australian mining industry, where it's our business to extract metal from the ground and the realities of that, and, and it's hard. You know, that, that's a challenging industry uh, in, in a practical context. But in Europe, they, they had these blind spots. They said, oh, we don't do mining. That's filthy. You know, you know, oh, no, 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 that's, that's, not, that's not good enough. So, all right. So, um, what do you do? So they talk in terms of you know how sustainable they are and how, how, how ethically superior they are to the rest of the world, but they don't extract their own resources. Mm. And so I called it the China Firewall because in Australia we mine uh, mm. uh, minerals and turn it into a concentrate, but we don't make metal. We truck that. We we ship that concentrate off to Southeast Asia, usually China, where they smelt it into metal and they turn the metal into products and then they sell the products to everyone else but we don't manufacture anything in australia and we don't make any metal in australia now in europe they don't do any mining either and all they do is they buy finished products or components off the market so any manufacturing in europe you've got all the components to put together those components are made in china right so the people in europe talking about um resource security and the critical raw materials map and and the circular economy and, and uh, they are doing it in context of, well, they just buy everything off the market. And their assumption was historically, I, I also saw, for example, the different cultures in Europe, like, like and you, you come up against, say, the Spanish culture or the French culture or the German culture or the British culture. Each one of those had a world empire at one stage. And so they have a seed inside their culture still that believes that, you know, that they're kind of, you know, They've got it down. They don't need anyone else's help. You know, we, we should be going to them for advice. You know, we, we used to run the world, you know. Uh, and, and so so they had this sort of thing where, well, we've got the money. And while we've got the money, we'll just buy the stuff. And that's the end of it. And so they saw resource extraction is something that happens in the Southern Hemisphere. Right. Uh, not, not our problem. So it was, it was, and so China was the firewall between the two. Now, while they were talking about circular economy, uh, and, and everything, and they, were, they were literally talking in circles, literally. Uh, and and um, it, uh, it, it took a bit of discipline not to lose my shit uh, because was, I've just come from a very difficult situation uh, to a situation where money was being thrown around and, I, I, and for the life of me, I couldn't work out what it was for. Because in, in the private sector, if you're not providing value of some kind, you're going down. Not only you going down, but everyone attached to you is going down. So you have to be on top of things, and you have to be uh, um, productive. And and any problems need to be sorted out because uh, if, if we if we don't do it, you know, this is when layoffs were happening and the mining industry was shrinking, and it was all very stressful. And but but in Europe, things were just, at the time things were just sort of floating around, and 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 it really blew me away. So so that actually helped me understand that there were a series of blind spots within Europe. You know, they, they weren't being um, foolish as such. It's that they actually literally didn't know and they didn't understand. So the circular economy started in 2008 and it started as uh, an action. What they realized was that uh, they were dependent on raw materials to support certain industries, businesses, right? And those materials were coming from somewhere else, mostly China. Right. And so they were concerned about keeping those businesses alive at, in their, at their point of genesis. They weren't concerned about the raw materials at all. Uh, and that actually has reflected how things are going on. It's they see it as a business enterprise evolution. Now, the Chinese also have a plan. Now, that plan is something which if they actually understood it at, at the time, for example, if China controlled everything, don't, doesn't shouldn't we go and look at what the Chinese are doing and what do they want? And there was this re reluctance to do it. You know, they said, it's like they didn't want to know. It, it, was, it was like they were, they were terrified of what the answer might be. And uh, uh, so, 
the I did my own research and I went and found someone who was actually in China and so and she was able to help me um, download the relevant information from the Chinese government websites and, and how things worked in China and, and that was an education and so I found this uh, plan called Made in China 2049 actually my, my friend Meng Chung uh, found it and she's since presented a few things uh, on that but but her work is top notch so what the, the, the thing of resources is a problem and every country in the world is quietly jockeying for position. Europe has a plan, the United States has a plan, and so China has a plan. But the plan for China is they want to own and control everything industrial on the planet, right? So um, if you want to engage in any way, like if you want to buy a computer, a car, a microphone, your headphones, anything like that, or involve um, any sort of commodity or material that requires industrialization to make it, you've got to do business with the Chinese in some fashion. So all wealth and all resources flows into China like a Hunger Games society architecture. You know, we've got the capital. Everything flows to the capital. And so if, we're, if there's not enough to begin to go around, they're going to make sure that the Chinese will resource and the rest of us would have to make do with what's left. That's their plan. And they're openly discussing that. And to this day, most of the people in Europe I, I, I talk to have no no concept of uh, that. They vaguely understand that there is a plan, but they, that they, they're reluctant to look at it you know, and meet the challenge head on. And I think it's because they instinctively know how vulnerable they are. And once they see it, they're required to do something about it. It's, it's something like that. So, uh, yeah, anyway, so... Uh, and then I joined um, a project called uh, the Screen Project, and I was actually uh, part of a group that was actually collecting information about, um, uh, and we were developing what we call the critical raw materials map, where we were showing information about what, um, what minerals that were of economic importance versus a possible supply, um, supply gap and inelastic market. And so they settled on 20 uh, minerals and uh, metals that were uh, considered uh, critical. But, um, and so I was part of these guys and we were collecting information all over the world. And, and I must say, these guys were very professional and much more competent than any other group I've come across to collect such information. But the way the project was structured was to look into our past. It was to look for the previous four years of how things have gone. It was not looking to the future at all. But everyone was using that CRM map as if it was looking for the future. This is what we will need to look at in future. That it, it, it's not how it was. There, was. there was a perception gap. And what was interesting was at the time, we were told we were not allowed to discuss energy. Because I actually asked them, you know, because I've been studying things like peak oil for years. And so why, if, if we're looking at, critical materials like we oil gas and coal and uranium are all raw materials and we need them and a lot of it doesn't come from here so, so why why don't we discuss it and oh we were told so look the project was set up by the european commission and they've laid down the law we must adhere to how they've done it and we must keep doing it so the work we do now can be compared to the work that was done then and it says you are not to discuss energy resources other people are looking at that so it turns out the other people who were looking at that were just collecting um, production data, as in what had been produced that year, they were just recorded. And so they weren't looking in terms of what reserves we had left uh, and, and the changes in the value chain and how things might, might, might change. And that really struck me as strange. Yeah, so, so our best and brightest were walled off from the real part of the problem. And, and I saw this in multiple places and, and it, um, they meant well. Like that, the, 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 they meant well. It's just this was the outcome. And so I went back to GDK and I said, look, this is what needs to happen. And so we are minerals blind, but we're also energy blind. And so we need to write a series of, well, I need to write a series of reports that shows this and puts the data on the ground and it needs to be public domain. And so I planned six, six reports. And... Um, uh, actually, if you like, it might actually be simpler to show you that. Here is um, 
I'm, I'm describing the plan. This was the last five years. It is actually worthwhile doing. By the way, I, I mentored uh, students and, and, and trained students. And one of the things I tell them says, because I often say, sorry, oh, so, sorry, I'm so sorry. And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> not only are you not sorry, you're going to do it again. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> just to, to give them the confidence that their opinions matter. Mm. So um, anyway, so I thought I'd have a laugh over that. So I'm sharing my screen. So this is what I call the big picture and a cunning plan. Uh, it was first developed in 2018, and you're seeing uh, an evolution when I was describing a version of it. So these reports don't happen in a vacuum. They were planned. But because of the controversial nature of that plan, um, that um, I wanted to release the reports in a reverse order so people didn't understand what they were until the last report landed, and then they could fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. So uh, the, the question was, what quantity of minerals are needed to phase out fossil fuels? And so we started out with the, the big thousand page report that you've got now. That's the first report uh, um, to, to look at if we were to read them in order of telling the story, but not order of publication. So we needed solid data for the number of electric vehicles, batteries and hydrogen cells and what have you, and an estimate of the energy mix. And the outcome was the task is much larger than currently understood. Nuclear is needed, but it's not can't be the magic bullet to replace fossil fuels. Power storage buffer stations are an issue. Biofuels are needed, but can't be scaled up. And one of the problems is we don't have the time to do this the way we think we're going to do it. And all existing non-fossil fuel systems may not be strong enough in terms of energy return and energy invested. So the next paper in sequence, and this one's actually being... Uh, written as a paper, uh, and it's in peer review at the moment, uh, but I've been showing some of the data from it, is the technology mineral quantities needed to resource the manufacture of a sustainable system large enough to completely phase out fossil fuels. That title has now been changed, but I looked at how much metal will we need to make one generation of solar panels and wind turbines, etc. And so the current rates of mining mineral production were not nowhere near enough, and neither were stated mineral reserves. And so we should consider different mineral systems to manufacture. And it's been suggested, why I've proposed, a mining frontier in Europe will be opened because we have to be uh, self-sufficient. And if we're going to maintain our own sovereignty, we're going to have to decouple from China. And we've got no choice but to mine our own territory. Minerals will probably become strategic assets the way oil is in Saudi Arabia. And so that goes to, well, okay, the report called The Mining of Minerals and the Limits to Growth. And that one's out. Uh, now, this is to show that the mining industry in its current form is actually struggling. Like, a conventional mining is evolving into a new business model, and it's struggling to maintain production growth. There's, there's a whole lot of technical problems they're dealing with, like lowering of grade and an increase in energy consumption and costs are going up. So the idea that the mining industry can expand a lot is... Um, is false. Like they, 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 they're just not going to be able to do it. And so then they go, well, okay, so we can't mine for more minerals. So the whole electric vehicle idea and green revolution, sorry, too bad, so sad, we'll just go back to fossil fuels. And that's when I give them the oil from a critical raw materials perspective report. And that was a tour of duty through the oil industry. That turns out to be the only government report written since 2005 that mentioned peak oil. Uh, the oil industry had it all sewn up with, you know, they, they had it all confidential, trust us, it's fine. You know, we've got this under control and actually they don't. So the answer for that is we should leave oil before it leaves us. And current peak oil production at the moment is in our past, November, 2018. So those four reports were to go to a point where, so, all right, well, we've got the five stages of grief. So the people reading that will, will go five, they'll, they'll rocket up and down the five stages of grief and they'll go, well, up to the point where they actually understand. And so then, then there's this black uh, window here. They want, need to understand that the EV battery, H-cell, solar panel, wind turbine, hydro plan is not viable as the final solution and basis of the next era of industrial ecosystem. And it's really a stepping stone to something else. And it would behove us to understand what that is. And so at that point, we can have an adult conversation. 
And as it turns out, that conversation is now actually being had now in Finland, which is really encouraging to see. So then they go, all right, smart guy, uh, fix it. And so uh, I put together this uh, report called Restructuring the Circular Economy into a Resource Balanced Economy. The circular economy in its current form is not going to work. It's not, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not practical. It has structural flaws. And so I see it as a stepping stone to something else. And so I've made a counter proposal of how we might change, how we uh, socially change, how we manage our uh, uh, material resources in an intelligent fashion. So it's the start of the development of a more sensible resource stewardship and management system. It's a holistic interaction between the industrial ecosystem, natural resources, recycling, and the planetary environment. Uh, but it doesn't look at the energy systems. And so I'm writing a book personally um, called the new electric and this has not been released yet but when i was doing the big uh, thousand page report i did a tour of duty through all energy systems and i found a whole lot of unconventional stuff um, uh, from from our past like when you actually looked at nicholas faraday's original notes in electrostatics there are a few things there that, that that we could have gone down so it's an unorthodox and not accepted by mainstream science but it is published in the literature and it's a completely new energy paradigm um, and it's the only visible response to the energy problem. So what's in here is things like, well, what was Nikola Tesla actually doing? You know, um, what was he actually doing? How might it have worked and how might we use it? So there's a tour of duty through all that. Things like zero point energy and uh, the electric universe and the, all, all these unorthodox ideas are going to be put in one place and I'm going to release it as a book and I'm going to publish it personally. GTK will say, all right, we're a geological survey. Um, and we're not going to let you publish this because there's no industrial scale data to support what you're saying. And that's fair enough. So I'm now going to do it personally. Anyway, so that, that is, um, that was the plan. So that plan has now come to, to a close. Um, oh, it's, the sixth piece of work is recycling. So now that we know we, we've got the, the n number of units and their metal. So if we make an estimate of how many solar panels and wind turbines are going to come offline each year as in to be decommissioned if we were to recycle them with current technology how much metal could come from that so they'll put through a thermochemical simulation platform called hsc and we'll do a series of, of of simulations things like wind turbines the blades have no recycling solution so they landfill them the blades get landfilled so imagine thirty thousand wind turbines a year for the next 50 years how much landfill that's actually going to be. So uh, anyway, so, so, so the idea was to work out how much metal can actually come out of recycling and how much waste plume will come out of that, those recycling systems and compare that against the amount of metal required to replace those units in the first place. And that'll give us the true relationship between mining and recycling once the system is stable. And so when that comes to a close, that will allow me to develop the, the next plan has been developed. It is yet to start up, though. That's the next five years. Well, starting the end of next year, maybe. Can I jump in with one quick question? Because you're looking at the relationship between the mining and the recycling. Yeah. What about the energy required for the mining? Okay, so that's Im embedded, embodied energy. That is a layer that is not in the calculations at the moment, and it's on the list of things to do. There's a whole th raft of things that, that are missing. Uh, for example, manufacturing uses an enormous amount of fossil energy as a feedstock. Most coal and gas goes into manufacture, and that's if we knock out gas and coal, we've got no substitute for that at the moment, right? Uh, uh, not uh, because they in, they need to generate heat, and so that hasn't been thought of. And so we may have a situation that when we phase out fossil fuels, we might actually phase out a lot of manufacture at the same time with no substitute. Uh, so that's missing. But the embodied energy. And the, the complexity, um, I call it thermal entropy. Uh, the thermal entropy associated with, say, an ingot of magnesium metal um, or aluminium. Aluminium's got a lot of, uh, requires a lot of electricity to, to produce. Um, that is not being done. And that once, that, that's going to be a, a reasonably complex piece of work to make the point. So um, work done in the future might be, for example, to work out to make a single um, wind turbine 
all the components to it, like where do they come from all over the world and what's the em embodied energy. We sum that energy up and the back of the envelope calculations at the moment show that the energy to create the materials and then manufacture the wind turbine and then get it into place is actually more than what that wind turbine will generate across its life cycle when it's then taken away. And so, so we're in this sort of uh, phase at the moment where the true costs of everything we do are, are not completely understood and there is a reluctance to understand them because we've got it easy at the moment. We, we are depending on fossil fuels, this, this cheap, abundant energy source, and it's actually allowing us to do all sorts of things. Are we swayed by the greenwashing effect, the perception to be doing good? Yep. You know, like you say, it takes more energy to to create a turbine than what it generates. But hey, look at the perception that uh, the Scandinavian countries have, Denmark, Sweden, all these wind turbines out, and oh, it must be such a, a green culture, you know, so environmentally friendly. And what you've spoken of is how much is externalized. You know, yeah. they don't mind, they preserve the environment, but hey, let's harm the rest of the world yep. to do that. So. Yep. Australia suffers because they export it, you know, and, and, and so on. So is that is that the, the, a big issue, you know, in terms of who you present to as well? Is that the bigger concern is how they're perceived? Is it being power hungry, wanting to stay in, in parliament because you seem to be doing this the right thing, but not really? So, yes, the, the, everything is actually outsourced. And so this, you've got this, this, this social uh, blind spot where they don't understand the true impact um, of their actions. So all our actions and decisions are done in isolation. We don't know where our materials come from and we don't know what happens to them when we throw them away. Uh, we assume the free market and market dynamics will just fix everything and uh, hands off the wheel, you know, it's all too hard. Um, we should let the market tell us what we need to do. And that is intellectually very lazy, uh, but this is actually how we've been conditioned to think. But what that means is the whole system will collectively grind to a halt once certain feedstocks become unavailable and and in the background of it you've got the biostress systems of you know the earth dynamic systems of of land degradation and species die off and and and, and all that and that is um like the entire bottom of the food chain both in the sea and on the land has been traumatized like the long-term viability of large mammal vertebrates like us that's grim Right, but that's not part of the discussion when we're discuss, discussing the stock market. <laughs> so, mm. uh, there, there is a lot of self-serving thinking at the moment in the current human civilization that we're, we, we prefer not to see. On the other hand, we have to feel that we're doing something. So when someone comes up with the idea that something is being done, then we can collectively sit back and relax and, oh, it's good then, we can get on with our lives. Something's been done. But that something's been done is not good enough. And so, well, no one wants to hear, for example, that the future is going to involve a lot of work for a very small return and it's going to be rather uncomfortable at least some of the time. But no one wants to hear that. Right? Like, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, wasn't he quoted as saying, no one ever got elected for telling people what they can't do? Uh, so the, the thing we've sort of settled on, in, like, the Green Movement has settled onto a, a groove 30 years ago, and they've gone down this particular track, whereas a lot of what they do and, and talk about is um, in isolation with some of the realities of how human civilization actually functions. Uh, and, and a lot of the, uh, I'm, I'm hearing, for example, at the moment, uh, we should get off livestock and we should uh, eat insects you know, to, to save the uh, environmental. And I actually blurted out on a meeting. Uh, a friend of mine in Australia called Sven Waits said this. Uh, he said, I would rather, I, I would start eating politicians before I consider start eating insects. <laughs> and I said this in an audience of politicians. Well, I might get in trouble for that later. Um, but, so so but that, that solution, uh, you know, if they put a seaweed additive into the diet of a lot of the livestock, then they don't produce as much methane farting, right? But the, but the real, yeah but, yeah, but also the real solution could be, for example, we just have less livestock and we go mostly vegetarian with the occasional bit of meat. That is more sensible. Eating insects, though, that has health problems that are not understood at the moment 
And yeah, I, I'll, I'll be eating politicians before I even consider that. So <laughs> it's probably more helpful for the environment. <laughs> who do you think is going to go first you know <laughs> eat the yeah. rich isn't it <laughs> yeah and and one thing we don't talk about enough and it's actually becoming more prevalent it just doesn't make the news but also the social injustices that happen mm. with a lot of a lot of these supposed solutions because with social injustice comes social unrest yeah. and with social unrest we don't need to say now which countries start, you know, flexing their muscle and, and, mm. and then you start having all sorts of other repercussions and wars, <clears> global <throat> wars and so on. So, and we know that a lot of wars are based on, they're resource-based, aren't they? You know, yes, they traditionally are. water, but now it's it's all about minerals and and and, and all sorts of other uh, components. And, and I think that's going to become more prevalent as well. So that's a reality. Um, you know, and, and a country like New Zealand, you know, Australia as well, you know, then you have to deal with a lot of uh, uh, refugees and, and, and there's so many implications. So it's not, yeah, it's complex. It's so very complex. In my oil report, let me share my screen again, because uh, I did a report on the oil industry and this is actually a chart in it. And what I've done here where I put every time that there was a war, right, for uh, the last 39 years, or pri prior to the actual report, um, I stated the oil reserves. So the columns on the left are the countries that actually were a battlefield subject to military strikes and troops on the ground. So we've got Iran, Iraq, and Kuwait. And then under that, countries that have been subject to economic sanctions. And again, Iran, Venezuela, and Russia. They've all been subject to economic sanctions. The column on the right is the aggressors who was doing the invading. And so we get the United States, Saudi Arabia, and they're linked to the 1973 petrodollar agreement. Iraq, prior to 1991, was actually an ally of the United States. Canada, the European Union, and the United Kingdom. And in those columns, I've got how many of those countries are peak oil literate? The answer is all of them. And then... All of those countries are actually uh, together in one big alliance. But both the aggressors and the recipients had oil. So the recipients had 44% of reserves, 27% of production, and 68 of consumption. The aggressors had 37% of reserves, 42% of production, and 42% of consumption. So what's happening here is as we approach peak oil, who controls the oil industry? And so that explains most wars, not all, but most wars in the last 39 years. It's an open and blatant resource war. They don't um, talk about that, you know, uh, but there it is. It, it's, it's out in the open. It's, it's, like, it's like the quiet part said out loud. Hmm. And there's a strong there's interest the in Australia at the moment too by the US in terms of um, expanding our mineral mo and metal mining, isn't there? Because we mm -hmm. want to become less reliant on China. Yeah, it's very political. Well, from that list, interestingly, that one country, China, is missing from them from mm -hmm. that list, and we know how much they want in on that action. Um, yeah. And and that's but they don't need quite... in on that action because they've got all the precious minerals for the so renewables. Yeah. The Americans yeah. had one strategy to control, or the West had one strategy to control the oil in the petrodollar empire. So the Chinese have been for the last 20 years developing another st uh, uh, strategy, and they don't use military aggression to do it. They use economic warfare, right? Um, and yeah. the fact uh, that they're using industrial capacity. They're the only ones on the planet that can do certain things. And so they're behind a lot of the construction of all the larger industrial uh, um, sites across the planet. And they own a lot of them. And they're doing things like they'll go and purchase a port. Like like uh, the port of Darwin, for example, was leased from the Australian government. They're doing those sorts of actions. And so it's almost mm -hmm. by stealth. So it's like the, the Western approach is like the game of chess, where we're trying to decapitate the, 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 uh, the enemy king. We're going to take out the enemy king, whereas the Chinese approach is the go game of Go, where they're trying to take over as much territory as possible quietly. And once they've got it, they're not going to give it back. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's not just Taiwan and Hong Kong. It's uh, the Asia Pacific Islands and and so on. And there's been a lot of that yeah. in the media at the moment. So there's, there's a lot of um, discussion, for example, about what the Russians are doing here at the moment. And it's it's all about they mm. they think they're going to invade and 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 they they want to expand the territory. But in a low energy world, the more territory that you hold, the more energy you've got to expend in doing so. So you need a damn good reason to do it. So in in my opinion, the Russians have already won. As in, they have gas, they're self-sufficient in food, and they've got nuclear weapons, but they also own the gas pipelines. <clears throat> Which means if the nations around them want that oil and gas, it's got to come through their pipelines. So in a, in a non-linear post-energy world, it's not about how much territory that you hold, so much as the influence that you can gain. Because now nation states will then have to pay a very high price and not just money in exchange for these energy resources. And if peak oil really was in 2018, all fossil fuels are now much more valuable and they have to be revaluated, right? But to do so is a breach of international law, right? So, but, so the game the Russians are playing and um, it's, it's my understanding that the Russians have just restructured their currency into a, an asset-backed currency. The ruble is now asset-backed, and it's the, the, the first one uh, in 50 years. But that takes years. But at the same time they've done that, they invaded Ukraine. And what does, does the West do? We hit them with every economic sanction we can dream up. And the problem is those economic sanctions are also a breach of international contract law. Right. And so while the Ukraine war is happening, and so the Russians then, two days after they've done that, said, OK, you've now got to pay for our gas using Russian rubles. You can buy it any time you want, but you will do it in our currency. Whereas in 1973, the uh, United States convinced the rest of the world to purchase all oil had to go through the US dollars. So they forced the world to buy a commodity using a currency and an, en an energy commodity at that. So we've gone from the oil and the US dollar to ruble, uh, the Russian ruble and gas. And I think it's a temporary thing. Uh, but what these Russians have done is forced a situation where their post fiat currency currency that's now asset backed is now being accepted. And if that is allowed to happen, all other fiat currencies will be under extreme pressure because they're not backed by anything and they're saturated by debt, which is why everyone is so intensely uh, upset and determined to win this conflict. But the Russians have been slow walking the conflict. The longer the conflict, as while that conflict happens, the sanctions happen. And while the sanctions happen, we can't go back to the way we were before. Right. And, and so to me, the war in Ukraine is being held open by things that have nothing to do with Ukraine. And it, 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 it's actually a function of peak oil is what we're seeing, but at a geopolitical level. And that's an opinion. And it, and it turns out um, a lot of the people around me don't quite see it that way. But that makes sense to me with what I'm seeing. Because now um, the Chinese are also restructuring their currency. And you know, they want to have a gold back to yuan. And, and whether they do it or not, I don't know. But I'm expecting... Uh, for example, the United States has not committed any large military presence to Ukraine. They've been sending lots and lots of small arms, but there's been no aircraft carrier strikes. There's been no um, you know, troops on the ground. There's been nothing serious. <clears throat> and I believe that they have not done so because they know that the moment they commit to Ukraine, the Chinese will move on Taiwan. And that is a real problem. The Americans must respond to that. And so... I believe eventually, or at some point, the Chinese will move on Taiwan. And remember, I was just saying, what is next after batteries? The answer is semiconductors, because the Chinese and the Americans have been battling for control of the semiconductor industry. The Taiwanese happen to control most of it. And if the Ch if the Chinese were able to take Taiwan, they take the semiconductor industry, right? And, and and so that is why the Americans are so adamant that this must not happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, but these are the sorts of moves that are happening, and they're, and they're below the mm. surface. But there, to me, is, is the, the controlling parameters of, of what's happening. 
And so this I'm saying is we are seeing a shift from one way of doing things to another, and energy is at the base of all of it. Speaking of Russia's influence, how much is this current war in the Ukraine influencing the rest of Europe, perhaps Finland in particular, because that's where you're based at the moment, in terms of, well, if we can't get gas or we're, you know, we're not going to take the gas or any of their energy, mm. we need to start looking at other sources. How much has that influence changed? Because there has been changed, mm -hmm. some change, hasn't there? So you have to remember that the anti-Russian sentiment here is epic because it's in living memory of the Russians doing mm. ethically unacceptable things, right? Uh, and and that is deeply entrenched in the culture, right? And so I, I work on the principle there are no good guys, there's only power dynamics, right? Everyone's jockeying and manoeuvring for position. And ethics is just like a fig leaf uh, for, for what they're actually doing. So if I may share, because I did prepare a slide that I presented to politicians, um, the, the, the following... Um, Hang on, where are you? Okay, so I actually put this slide together about the um, net position of uh, what's happening in Europe. Okay, so I took the largest uh, producers of gas in the world uh, and, you know, the, the largest seven or eight. But And I, I found that the largest producers also happen to be the largest consumers. Right, so when they produce gas, it, it's they consume a lot of it domestically. So what actually gets exported? And so then you've got this, uh, um, the, the green numbers are the export, the net export. So Russia was exporting 227 billion cubic meters a year, right? But uh, the United States was only exporting 82 billion cubic meters a year. So what, once you actually sort of get the net export, but Europe... The European Union needs um, 332 billion cubic meters. So when something like this, Europe needs 332 billion cubic meters a year. Russia was supplying to the market 227 billion cubic meters, but now that's been taken out, right? So they've been that's been withdrawn from the market. But if we sum together Qatar, Australia, and the United States, right, uh, together, that's only 320 billion cubic meters a year. And that is a shortfall. And to do that, Australia, Qatar, and the United States would have to uh, forego all existing contracts. So they'd have to sort of, you know, uh, um, uh, reject all existing uh, contracts and then send it all to Europe with infrastructure that doesn't exist. <clears throat> so Russian gas cannot be replaced from somewhere else in the market. And Europe is now in a conflict that has no acceptable outcome. And I believe Russia is attempting to do what the U.S. did in 1973 by insisting on gas purchase with rubles, uh, which is now an asset-backed basket commodity. And winter's coming, so we are we are actually in a um, in a um, <clears throat> uh, ha bit of a pickle. So 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 most of Europe does not have gas supplies because last winter they were all run, were run down, and now they have no gas. Right, and so we get energy shortages, and all the industries, the, the, and the, the heating um, is puts the civilian population in a, in a difficult position. But all their industries depend on gas, and so, you know, most of the um, gas that was coming into Europe did come from Russia. So we have already destroyed our economy, and that has yet to ripple its way out, and and so it, th these are tectonic moves, right? You know, th this is how wars happen. You know, uh, you know, needs must, but but here's the odd thing: the Russians have the gas and we don't, right? So we can't force them to sell it to us in our terms. They're trying to force us to buy it on their terms, right? So how do we get out of that? <laughs> um, and, and so, I, 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 but the anti-Russian sentiment is amazing. You know, like it, it, it's, it's uh, uh, the, the Russians aren't aren't liked or respected at all, and you know there's historical reasons for that. So Europe finds itself in a very very difficult position. Um, but I also think that most nations around the world are going to go through some version of this in some form. We just, we just happen to be going first. 
So on that then, I mean, you've made it quite clear in your report and a number of the um, presentations that I've watched that we need an unprecedented amount of metals and minerals and it's just, yeah. it's not going to happen. But what about other options like biofuels or nuclear? Like what's your opinion <clears throat> on nuclear fusion, for example? Because it always seems like it's, you know, five to ten years away, but they've been saying yeah. that for about half a century. So, so what what are the logistics around that? Okay, so I do have uh, some information on that. In the big report, I actually did look at bias, uh, both of those. So this is in the big report. So let's take one year's uh, consumption for petroleum uh, products, uh, gasoline, petrol, diesel, maritime, mar uh, marine fuel, and jet fuel. So if we were to replace that with biofuel, <clears throat> and if we did it with the most efficient uh, way possible that we've got at the moment, which happens to be uh, soy and corn. So that is actually the arable land needed to grow that for what we need as a substitute for the year. And there's a calculation associated with that. So here's a chart for uh, land use on the planet at the moment. 70% is ocean at the top. Um, and then we've got forest is about 7.66%. And the, the red square we've got here is, is our arable cropland. So the biofuel bio, uh, is in competition with that red there. And that's how much uh, land we would need, arable land, to grow biofuels. So it's in direct competition with food production. It eclipses what we have, and it's about the equivalent of what forest is left on the planet. So that's unlikely. So here is our arable land use so far. So we've got an unprecedented amount of arable landing use at the moment because of our population. And we, we're just not going to be able to produce enough biomass to make enough biofuel. And then there's the water problem. So if we were to water, uh, they're very uh, water intensive, those crops. <clears throat> so this is the water needed. So there is the water... Uh, um, 2018 global annual fresh water withdrawal is on the left and on the right is the amount of water we would need in an annual context to uh, irrigate those crops fresh water and this is what we're drawing from the water system so what this is showing is um what this is showing is uh um the whole idea of biofuels, which I think we will do, because it's the only way to, to keep the aviation industry going in a sensible form. But but we've got to be have an intelligent conversation about what can be withdrawn from the environment and why. So everything needs to be put on the table and discussed. But the idea that biofuels can just save us as a as a magic bullet that that's not going to happen. That brings us to nuclear. Uh, actually, before we move on to nuclear, you got any questions about biofuels about how this is calculated? Well, I was just going to add in that a lot of our listeners will be familiar with a lot of the similar issues here with intensive <clears throat> agriculture farming, the amount of water hmm. that we're using, the amount of land that we need and land that we're still native land, forest growth and so on that we're clearing. That's just for the food we're eating. Now, you're compounding this with biofuel. And as you've said, we just don't have the land. Yeah. Uh, it's It's... I don't, you know, it's pretty clear. So if that's to become a solution, something's got to give. That's right. Very quickly. So then you, uh, um, I had a whole lot of information collected on things like the deterioration of the biosystems, like species die off and land degradation and, and acidification of the oceans and, 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 and all that. And so the, all of those things need to be brought to the table all at the same time. Mm. So, um, so what we're basically saying is we've been growing without limits without or all cares to those limits for some time and now we're hitting planetary uh, uh pl planetary yeah. global uh, limitations all right what about the net energy return on biofuels so that's interesting it's uh the energy return and energy invested is between 0.3 and 0.5 but when you actually looked at, I looked at algae, you know, the use of um, algae to make biofuels, and that had a negative energy return on energy invested. Like, it, uh, um, like for, for every one uh, calorific unit got out of it, it required 10 to produce in the first place. Like, it's very negative. Uh, but 
the corn and soy has a very small positive energy return and energy investor, but it's well below what's needed. If we are to be a sensible society, hang on, where are we? There we go. Yeah, so, we're, we're yeah, all so in. This is energy return and energy invested, and this is how we traditionally show it. So this is the net energy cliff. Uh, it was actually developed by one of the guys on the oil drum, uh, which, you know, that the, the, those discussion groups, while they just, you know, they're just some guys on the internet, they did actually do the starting seed work for a lot of this uh, work. And, and I was one of them, uh, but I consider myself an amateur compared to what those guys are doing. Anyway, so the, net, the dark grey is the net energy for society, and the pale grey across the top is the energy consumed to gather the energy. So if you're actually consuming, let's say you've got 100 units of energy that you're going to extract, uh, with say, oil back in 1900. And so, all right, we needed one unit of energy in versus 100 back. That's pretty good. But for biomass, for, uh, you know, for... Um, to get um, to get say like one unit of energy, we're, we're having to consume. Um, uh, I, I don't know how how would you put it. So, so the energy return on energy invested is around point point five to point one, and in some cases is negative. So you, you're up around the nineties for a hundred uh, uh, units coming back. Now the two bars there uh, for society to have economic growth. This is something Charlie Hall came up with. Energy return and energy invested of about 11 to 1 is required for society to function as it is now. The second bar is 7 to 1. That is for our very, very basic needs, things like uh, sewage sanitation and uh, uh, potable drinking water and, and stuff like that. So society needs energy to function. A lot of the renewable energy systems sit below that. So... The energy return on energy invested for oil has been declining since the 1950s. Mm. And for gas, that peaked again in the 1950s, and we're well and truly in declining. Uh, coal is the only fossil fuel that's increasing. Uh, but, you know, coal is carbon, so that's a problem. And so energy returns for fossil energy all summed together peaked in 1960 and we're on the downward slope. This is the idea that fossil fuels are on their way out. So that's that's an energy return, energy invested. So I've got to play devil's advocate here, though, if you don't mind, because Ooh. when we covered this topic last time about the limits to growth, <laughs> um, there were some questions raised about the role of technology. And I know we've seen technology advances in many industries, including renewables and batteries, I suppose, to, to yep. some extent. Um, you know, there, your data makes it very clear, but I've just got to ask the question. Mm -hmm. There are some experts out there that claim we could potentially be powering the world with renewables within 10 years if the political will was there. <laughs> um, yes, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, basically. <laughs> basically, the question is, do you think it's possible for technological advancements to actually bridge the gaps in what we have at the moment? So I do have an opinion here. Uh, that opinion is not a very popular one. Um, so I've worked in research and development of mining for 18 years, and all innovations are very small step changes. That mining is, is it tends to be a lot of capital involved uh, and it, it's really hard to actually sort of get even incremental improvements. So technology is able to advance in leaps and bounds, but it's been able to do that in the past because it's just, a, uh, it's had easy you know, credit, but it's also on the assumption we've unlimited energy and unlimited mineral resources to support that technology development. So what, those experts need to understand is we need to see an evolution, uh, leaps and bounds evolution in where we get our metals from. We have to somehow source our metals, lots of metals with, with either low energy or we find an energy source that is so fantastically large it doesn't matter anymore. Now, so the idea, so, so what I'm saying here is commodities like oil and um, copper, for example, behave very differently to technology. So the, the, the idea, for example, is metal price goes up or the price of oil goes up. That will um, make 
um, that will encourage more exploration into areas that were previously unviable economically, right? Therefore, more economic resources can come online and supply and demand will regulate and more resources will come online. That's not how the oil industry has gone. I've actually got some numbers to show that they don't correlate at all. So commodities uh, behave very different to um, technology. And the, uh, what I think is driving that is it takes about 20 years incubation time to get a commodity operation going, whereas technology has an incubation cycle of three or four years, right? So technology by its nature will move very quickly. Commodities by its very nature will move very slowly and they are decoupled, but they are attached to each other. So um, the idea that technology will come up with a new energy system well, the idea that, that uh, technology innovation will give us more metals and materials does not uh, take into account the deposits that are left. We mined out all the high-grade ones a long time ago, and now we've got these, these massive, low-grade, hard-to-work, um, very expensive-to-extract mineral deposits that are left that are energy-intensive. But the idea that technology will deliver us an energy system, you know, needs must. Someone will think of something, right? does not honor the fact that that energy has to come from somewhere. We need an energy source, a natural energy source. The, it, it, that they have the idea that economics, for example, is a power source. It is a physical power source that can actually alter reality. It's not. It's a management system. The materials that go into it need to be managed. So, um, yeah, and so, so, so the idea that we're just going to... So, uh, come up with a new technology uh, and, and everything. And even if we did develop a system tomorrow, the other thing that's not really understood is time. It takes time. You know, uh, you know five years to build a power plant uh, that when we know what we're doing. Uh, 15 years for a nuclear power plant. Uh, you know, it takes 15 to 20 years to open a mine after the deposit's been discovered. You know, uh, it will take an enormous amount of time to uh, uh, develop that. Uh, so the, the, the sheer volume of metals we need to do this completely scotches the idea of any kind of efficiency gains at all. And so, and this is something we need to come to terms with. Hmm. So society as it is at the moment is, you know, we talk about advancements. We talk about needs and wants. Right now, you know, as an example, Every year, Apple has a new, a new model, a new yep. phone model. We must have it. Uh, every brand is trying to, you know, to remain profitable. To remain profitable, you got to keep growing. Just to stagnate, you're not, you're not growing. You're not, you're actually losing money. So we're in the spiral of just this constant. It's capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. It's this, it's the society we're in. Mm -hmm. This is going to come crashing down very fast. And we're already starting to see a lot of the signs, delayed delivery of, of a lot of products and technology, uh, you know, supply issues. What should we be doing? What should we be transitioning to? What, what societal changes should we be undertaking? I mean, this is a big loaded question here, but something needs to start changing. Yeah, and we can't wait for our leaders, our politicians, our, uh, because that's not happening. And as you started right at the beginning, then they're not acknowledging it for whatever reason. Yeah. So, so what what should start happening so as of yesterday? My understanding of, of uh, this question, uh, I was listening to a podcast from Nicole Foss. By the way, she does excellent work. Um, I highly recommend you go and find her for one of your um, uh, podcasts. She was. Uh, what I found is anyone with any sort of training in the science of biology has a very good handle of the pickle we're in at the moment. So a biological system, its size and its complexity is defined by the energy we put into it. If that energy is withdrawn, the size must shrink and the complexity must simplify. The end. As in that, that That's a hard reality. So we are in that situation now. So what to answer your question the first step is understanding we must collectively understand the predicament we're in whereas at the moment 
only a few people do, and everyone else is uh, having a head in the sand moment. You know, uh, we, we don't wish to know. So, so first, we've got to understand, but not just in ones and twos, and not just our leaders either, all of us have got to understand. Because there's a social change coming. So, and so if we understand the pickle that we're in, when things start getting difficult, we understand why. And if we can understand why, then we're less likely to riot and turn on each other. Because the person next to you is actually not your problem. The person next to you is actually your solution once you get to work. Because the only power source we've actually got that we can control is us. Human labor, human ideas. Right? So do and, we and potentially look to, you know, Cuba, for example? Yes, I mean, they exactly. radically so, changed how they were set up. So there's a number of historical precedents you can look at, right? So what happens, what, 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 what's happened in the past? As this is part of understanding what's going on. Uh, Cuba is one. Argentina, 2001 is another. Brazil, 1994 is another. Uh, Germany, 1935, what happened there? Uh, but then there's historical ones like, um, you, know, um, you know, what happened on Easter Island? And so, so um, um, historically years ago. So the idea of collapse is, you know, civilization collapse is now being challenged, right? They said, oh, they didn't collapse. They're still there, you know, uh, but, but you can have like a setback. Like at the end of, end of the last Bronze Age, end, end of the Bronze Age, sorry, uh, lots of civilizations had a very tough time over a 200-year period and they all collapsed. And that's probably related to a volcanic eruption of some sort. But what I'm saying is the environment changes, our ability to do things changes, what sort of problem solving needs to happen. Uh, the, re the reason I'm sa saying that is we must understand as a species the predicament we are in and how things might go. And so when things get difficult, we have uh, a series of ideas to understand not only what is happening and why, but what we might do about it based on what's happened before. So yes, Cuba is a good example. Uh, and uh, we have to understand that we have to uh, radically shift. So the second step is a con the development of a new paradigm. Now, in that paradigm, what is a strength is diversity of thought. If you look at, say, like the Amazon jungle, you've got literally thousands of different species interacting. And if an external change happens, some of those species will do well in that change and some will not. But whatever happens... The jungle has the solution within it based on a diversity fashion of what works and what doesn't. We need the same way in terms of sustainability. In fact, that's also what happened in Cuba, where you had like the amazing variability of how they would approach. And so in a results on the ground, what worked, what didn't, can we learn from each other? And it's going to be messy. It's going to be organic. But we have to make a new paradigm. Then I think what's going to happen is society will split into four groups. Right. Uh, group one is the people who will defend the status quo right to the bitter end. You know, they don't want to hear about it. We've all seen them. Uh, we've all met them, uh, the, these people. There's nothing you can do about them. So we've got this thing called free will, and you can't force someone to think something or to do something. So you can't talk to them. And you can't reason with them. So wish them goodbye and leave them behind. Bye-bye. And, and so things will get increasingly difficult for them. Don't be there when they finally realize that. Group two are the people who are going to say, all right, we've now got a problem. The situation's changing. In a needs-must kind of way, we are now going to look at what do we need to uh, deliver what society needs? Where do we get our food from? What about you know potable water? Heating, if we need it to survive, how do we do that? Uh, uh, how do we maintain our, our emergency services? Yeah, things like that. How do we hold society together in a shifting environment? And we're going to see some amazing problem solving uh, there. And that's going to be po possibly the largest group. Group three, uh, oh, no, um, a small proportion of people that they're like a subsection of group one almost, where they realize everything's gone, to, uh, gone sideways, uh, but they're not really prepared to be part of the solution. But what they will do is go Viking. We're going to go and take stuff. And we're going to see that at the nation state level. We're seeing a bit of that now on the nation state level for the last you know, 10, 20 years. Uh, so, you know, uh, we're not going to create anything new, but we're going to take, come and take your stuff. 
and they get those those people are going to have to be managed. You know, uh, and the fourth group, the people who said, well, we would now like to make a society to new limitations that actually maintains our existing knowledge and wisdom. But we're now going to build and construct a society using that knowledge and wisdom. But it's going to take 60, 70, maybe even 100 years to do, uh, to achieve that. And so the people engaged in that work will work hard, but they may not actually even see the results and fruits of their labor. And there'll be a subsection of group two. Right, and so so I, I think we're gonna split into those four groups in terms of paradigm. And each of those groups will just do their own thing. And, you know, and then they'll band together in, into groups and they'll try and sort of, uh, um, uh, get with it. I think, for example, the most successful units could be the small town, mm. or you know, up up to say like fifty thousand people or a hundred thousand people, uh, because it's it's small enough from a metabolic and entry point of view to function in a relatively low energy context. But you've got enough people there who can actually band together into working groups and do stuff. Uh, I think we're going to go back to. Uh, something you know uh, a combination of 1880s level technology uh with uh regular examples of 1940s technologies you know we could we're not going to make a transistor and we're not going to make a uh, microchip uh, in australia or new zealand but we could do something like wind an electric motor and we could start casting metal parts ourselves with relatively simple metallurgy we're not going to be able to resource these really complex mega factories that you see in you know, China and in South Korea. Uh, and so the technology will be simpler and there'll be rare examples of modern technology, but there'll be much less of them. And so, so everything's going to be a big old mess and, and a mix. And so we've, I've got trouble in uh, seven sectors. And I believe those troubles will have a pain threshold and we'll see them in an order. First thing we'll see is trouble in the financial front. Our financial systems are virtual and they can go any time and we're well and truly over our skis on that one. So now normally what happens when we have a financial meltdown is we just uh, replace all the politicians and then we um, make all sorts of excuses and, and, and often we'll have a nice relaxing war to actually go off and, and create some more economic activity. And, and we all promise never to do this again. But this time round, when we have a financial crash, we're going to have an energy crisis at the same time, peak oil and what have you. So now you've got the problem of uh, we can't use a lot of energy, so we can't expand. We can't go off and do um, a big in industrial expansion to create economic value because we don't have the energy. So now we're in the situation is while our economic systems are in trouble, we've now got a situation where energy systems are in trouble as they are, and we've got to go and uh, find a solution. And our solution at the moment is the green um, revolution, you know, things like solar panels and wind turbines. At that point, we're going to find that we don't have enough minerals or time. Right? And that's actually quite clear in its current form. So while we have no money and uh, um, depleting energy, we've now got the idea that we don't have enough minerals to, to mine to make these systems for everyone. Now, it's the only plan we've got, so we're going to do it. But what it means is the, the systems will be much smaller than we think they are. And our alternative systems that don't require energy are going to have to uh, be developed. So then the fourth sector is, well, um, we've got um, problems with the industrial agriculture sector. Uh, for every 0.8 cubic metres of soil, uh, uh, for every bushel of wheat being sent to the market, uh, 0.8 cubic metres of soil is being sterilised through poor industrial agricultural practices and also the uh, waste runoff of uh, the use of petrochemical fertilisers is uh, overloading the phosphorus and nitrogen cycles on the planetary scale. So, so we've got uh, industrial agriculture in its current form is uh, not sustainable and there'll come a point when we have to actually change what we're doing and the only solution that i can see on the books at the moment that what they think they're going to do is genetically modified organisms administered by ai robots to do the farming and that to me is the equivalent of the petrochemical revolution in the 60s it's a stopgap measure 
but after that stock get measure, our net position is actually worse. Uh, so small scale organic is probably um, the only way to go there that I can see at the moment done many times. That's a pretty scary thing to suggest. Like most people at the moment don't grow their own food. They just don't. And we're going to, we, we get it from the supermarket, but, but we have to get to get to the point where most people will grow their own food. Uh, and so that's going to be quite a disruptive um, change in, in, in its own right. So uh, the, 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 um, the sector after that is manufacture. Our supply chains are very, very complex. They're all over the world. Our technology is very complex and it's dependent on ease of transport. <laughs> so let's say, let's say uh, there's a case study in Scotland where they were fishing salmon. So the fishing trawler gets the salmon and they put it into a big ship and that ship goes to uh, Vietnam and they take the fish out and they put it in a cannery and they put the salmon in cans, right? And the cans are then put back on the ship and the ship goes back to Scotland and it puts it put in a supermarket. So the fishermen who caught the fish then go down to the supermarket to buy food for their dinner and they're buying tins of salmon that they themselves caught. Right, but it's travelled you know, across. The, I did a calculation: thirty-two thousand kilometres. You know, and that's considered perfectly acceptable because it's 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 the economically viable way to do this. So, so our manufacturing systems uh, are quite vulnerable, especially if we phase out fossil fuels uh, we don't, as a feedstock, you know, to generate heat in particular. Uh, a lot of the solutions to to uh, counter that. Um, have, have their logistical problems. So you can use your um, biomass to heat, um, to get heat almost to where, where we need. Uh, you need 2,000 to 2,200 degrees centigrade uh, to make a solar panel. This is to, to mm. produce a silicon wafer. At the moment, mm. the only way we can do that is, is, is uh, coking coal. Take away coal, you don't have solar panels. Right, uh, and so you've got this ripple in effect that's going to go through our manufacturing system, and at the moment we have no solution for a lot of it. Uh, so, the sector number six was biosystem stress, you know, species die off, land degradation, ocean acidification, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the seventh sector was um, population overshoot. So, and so that last one's interesting because if you put each person into a six meter square section, which is what you know, is the minimum amount of space uh, for a prisoner in one of our prisons, right? So if you put every, every we, we've now got 8 billion people, 8 billion people into that, you could fit the population of the world into Finland seven times, right? So it's not a question of population density. And also our fertility rates are going down in the West. And this is what Elon Musk was, was, was worried about. Where the trouble begins is each person that is brought online will consume resources and as time has gone on our society has required more complex technology which has resulted in more resources per capita so resources of all kinds are now being consumed at an unprecedented rate before they're all finite now the problem ones are the renewable resources as in our biomass and we're over our skis in terms of how much biomass we're pulling out of the planet. So we are, we do have a population problem. That problem has to be resolved in a fashion where each person is not consuming so much. If we can do that, we can resolve the population problem. Also, if we can do it where we're not so wasteful and if we can distribute our resources more effectively, then we can resolve the problem. If we don't do that, then we have our problems with population overshoot and so they, they were the seven sectors and in the order of pain threshold that I actually was able to present to a um, group of senior people last week and they were able to meet all that with an open mind which validated my idea of leaving Australia because that would never happen in Australia so for the listener as you've mentioned there is a time scale to a lot of these initiatives um so should we all be, you know, planting vegetables right now? Like what are some Ooh. kind of, yeah, sorry. So, well, that's, that's an interesting thing. Uh, well, well, it was when you suggested to do that, I actually tried that on Mount Tamarine and that was hard. To have one foot in the sustainability camp and one foot in the corporate world, that, that 
that was very difficult. And and um, so what I suggest is first you understand what's going on and then you pick a hobby. Find something that you can call a hobby. Uh, you know, growing your own vegetables, for example. Right. But do it in a way where you you do it as a hobby and you understand it. And if things get difficult, you can change and evolve on the fly. You become a learner. You adapt to change and you've got the knowledge that you've actually got with you. Me, for example, I am learning to distill my own whiskey. And that is my way of contributing value. So so each family household has got to do something where it contributes value to the rest of society, where the rest of society is very happy to see you. If you're in a situation where you're not doing that, society will say, oh, you're, you're, you're taking stuff and not contributing. So, so do reality you think we'll get to a point? Up. Yeah, sorry. Go on. I was just yeah. going to say, do you think we'll get to a point where, you know, hopefully we're all in that community number two, um, that we get to like a barter system effectively? So I believe a barter system will rise because that's what happened historically, right? But our society at the moment is way too complex to run on just that. So we're probably going to have a barter system and we're going to have a currency system sitting on top of that, but the currency system is going to be fragmented and not as consistent. So you're going to have problem solving tools in your, you know, uh, uh, to access the uh, uh, multiple things. It's not going to be any one system that you're going to depend upon. Sometimes you'll be bartering. Sometimes you'll be engaging in um, uh, um, the, the currency system, whatever that is. And that currency system uh, at the moment, we can't go back to physical money either because our current system requires fast transactions over a wide distance. It's, it, we're now geared to need that electronic transfer. So the nature of money, what, what is that? I don't know the answer to that. D- does that mean we stop doing things where we're transferring over large distances or do we develop a, a way where currency can be trusted again? And the word is trust. Um, so so, so I, I think the idea that, that society will change and instead of being an, an isolated, at the moment we're a family unit and we don't tend to talk to our neighbours much. Uh, and we're encouraged to be individuals, which makes us very dependent on the system at large. But the idea of communities in general is going to be, uh, I believe, a very successful strategy. It won't be the only one, but it'll. It, but and, and and the idea, for example, that we can help each other. If you, for example, had a hobby of growing uh, herbs, and you had a knowledge of how to turn those herbs into useful things like medicinal uh, products, or you could make soap. You know, uh, or, or something as simple as that. And then you can trade that with someone else. If you really couldn't be asked growing vegetables, make something else that you can trade with and, you know, give him a box of soap in exchange for a box of carrots or something. I, I don't know. You know. Bottle of whiskey. Yeah. yeah. Well, the whiskey <laughs> is actually, uh, it'll be seen as something that, that is valuable, but also the ability to produce alcohol. Uh, mm. which means uh, it's, it's very valuable industrially for all sorts of reasons. And it, you, know, you can do things like you can sterilize things and uh, it, it, it will have its uses. Um, so that, 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 and and, and you, if you pick a hobby... You, you rationalize how you want it. Yeah. Just just keep making the whiskey. <laughs> well, yeah. well, it used However to, you sell it. It used to be horse and cart. When I was in Australia, I had a Clydesdale stallion and everything was horse and cart. And, and that was, uh, it dominated the lifestyle. To keep that operation going, it was very, very hard. And it got to the uh, point where I wasn't able to uh, do it properly anyway. And so my first attempt at, uh, at doing that didn't work. Uh, I also, I had my second marriage come apart in, in that environment too. Uh, my w- wife at the time did not, uh, she sort of understood while this sort of stuff was necessary in the beginning, but when nothing happened for a couple of years, she goes, yeah, yeah, I'm sick of listening to this. And, um, you know, and then when the mining industry crashed and the money ran out, uh, I lost the, I lost my family as well. And so I came out of that and thinking, right, well, okay, so whatever I do now, it has to be on a smaller scale. And I have to be able to say, I'm doing this because I like it. 
mm. and, and there's, there's, there's a, a reason for it. And so that's how I'm sort of uh, approaching, uh, approaching all that now. And, and so developing the ability to adapt and learn and understand uh, and find like-minded people and talk to them and listen to what they say. And I found that with the sustainability stuff, that the group two stuff, that went through several eras of development. Uh, you know, and uh, the problem solving in the beginning proved very quickly to be inadequate. And so I went through several generations of it. And I think we'll find the same thing with this as well. So there is no one solution, no magic bullet. Um, you, but, but, but take an interest. And so, so if you take an interest, when things get interesting, you have the luxury of not panicking or not behaving as programmed. And COVID has shown us that, yeah. <laughs> what society, how society can behave. Mm. Simon, we're so conscious of, of the time so far. This, this can carry on mm -hmm. for hours on end, but um, I think we need to land this plane, so to speak. So we've, we've, absolutely privileged to have sat through this and 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 listened to to fascinating insight from yourself the experience the wisdom that you bring to this clearly for society buying an electric vehicle or putting solar panels on your roof is not is not being proactive for the future it's not the way forward um you've you've imparted a lot of sure a lot of facts a lot of statistics but some valuable lessons that we as society should be undertaking learning experimenting problem solving um being adaptable is hugely important um this diversity of thought concept that you've put forward is, is hugely important so it's not about individuality we do always say that you know each one of us a little thing we each do amounts to something bigger but we need to collaborate um, and we need to move forward as, 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 as a community and as a society. So thank you so much for your time um, and, and the, amount, the, the amazing lesson you've given us, um, a lot of food for thought, excuse the pun, um, and drink on the side. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Simon. We really, really appreciate this opportunity. You're welcome.